Good morning and welcome to the church program for Morfa Vale Seventh Day Adventist Church, May 30. It's been exciting to actually see the number of people and number of places around the world that people log in. And the other thing that having these programs online has enabled us to do is invite people past members and people from all around the world actually to contribute. And uh, it's broadened uh, our a number of people who have been able to join in and I want to say thank you to everybody who's done that. Today we actually start a program which is on the story of Jonah and what we can learn from Jonah's story and uh, this will be a series and uh, Pastor Travis will take the first one this week and get us underway. Before we start, I just wanted to uh, remind you all, and hopefully everybody's managed to log on to the e-giving app, and that's just to let you know that our offering this week is for Project Refresh. So essentially what that means is any of the uh, infrastructure that goes behind this program is going to be supported by this Project Refresh offering. And the other thing is that it's actually going to make sure that by the time these restrictions are lifted, we're gonna go back to a welcoming place where we can bring in more people to learn more about God, which I think is something that we all wanna to give to. And so I just wanna take this moment to thank everybody for, um, for giving, um, giving your support through the e-giving app and to again mention that it's Project Refresh this week. So um, I hope you all enjoy the program that has been prepared today. Hi everyone, hope you're doing okay out there. Let's pray together. Dear God, we just want to praise you for who you are. You are our creator. You made us in your image and that is amazing. Dear Lord, we praise you for you are our saviour and we just thank you so much for that. We praise you that you allowed Jesus to come and die on the cross that each one of us has eternal life. And we just praise you for always being there for us, being that friend through Jesus to each one of us. Dear Lord, we want to also thank you. We want to thank you for our friends, for our family, and for our church community. Thank you that you are always with us and you never leave us. Lord, we want to also ask today that you'll be with those people that are struggling with this COVID-19. For those people that are struggling in isolation, I just pray that you'll be with them. But Lord, I pray that you'll help us to know who they are, that we can touch base with them. But Lord, help them to realise that you are with them at all times. Lord, we ask that you'll be with those people that are sick at this point. Just watch over them as well. Be with them and care for them. Lord, we also pray that you'll be with Pastor Travis as he takes our uh, sermon today. Just ask that you'll, may we get a message from what he has to say to us. I pray in your name. Amen. Good morning, girls and boys. It's a lovely Sabbath day, isn't it? Every Sabbath is lovely because so we can spend some time with our families and we can spend some time with God. I've got a story for you from the Bible today and it's a, called a moose story. The moose is telling the story. And I'd like to read it to you. I hope you enjoy it. It's called Wet and Wild. Have you ever been to the Wet and Wild Park up there in Queensland? I must admit I've never been there, but it sounds a lot of fun. Maybe one day you'll be able to go up there and I'll go up there too, just to experience it. Let's start our story. It's the moose with a story that's old but not stale about a man called Jonah and a very big whale. I hope you can see the pictures around. God spoke to people way back in those days 
There was no Bible to show us his ways. These people were called prophets. They were ordinary folk. And on this occasion, to Jonah, God spoke. Go to Nineveh, Jonah, and preach. There's lots of my people down there we can reach. Tell them the things that they do there are bad. People are not good, and that makes me sad. I don't want them hurt, but being bad has a cost. Tell them to change so no one will be lost. Hop up now, Jonah, and go on your way. The people down there need to hear what you say. What do you think Jonah would tell him? Simple instructions, wouldn't you agree? So off went the prophet down to the sea. But hang on a minute, something's astray. The prophet has gone the wrong way. Can you see the signpost and see what it says? This way it says to Nineveh. Is that where God told him to go? Yes, it is. But what does it say this way? And he's heading that way. It says Joppa. And he's going to Joppa. What's happening here? Let's keep on reading the story. Did he get lost? Was he mistaken? Could it be, by chance, the wrong way he had taken? I'm sorry to say, and reluctant to voice, that the way he was headed was taken by choice. He must have been scared and not up to the task. So he headed for Joppa and proceeded to ask. Let's see what he asks at Joppa. Is anyone sailing their boat far away? I'm ready to go and have money to pay. Just take me quick, right now, on the double, on travelling light, and won't be much trouble. Well, I'm only a moose of average high Q, but running from God is not something I'd do. Would you run from God? I wouldn't. I'd run to God. I know he loves me. What was he thinking? Where would he go? Is there a place on the planet that God does not know? Who created our planet? God did, didn't he? So he knows everywhere. So how could you run away? Jonah thought Tarshish might be that dark place overseas and away from God's face. So off went the prophet, the captain and crew, sailing away on the ocean so blue. I forgot to turn the page. It's a pretty ocean, isn't it? Nice and blue. A nice day for sailing, but wait, what's happening? Let's see what happens. But it wasn't too long before the weather changed form, for on the horizon was brewing a storm. This was no storm of normal construction. It was sent from the Lord for Jonah's instruction. God realised he was going the wrong way. Could Jonah hide from God? No. The storm hit hard as the wind blew and blew. It was a frightening time for the captain and crew. The only thing louder than waves that were roaring was Jonah, the prophet, sound asleep and snoring. How could he sleep when the sea was so rough? Running from God must be such tiring stuff. The 
men went to Jonah, still sleeping below, and said, What can we do to make the storm go? This storm is a form of correction in motion. Pick me up now and throw me into the ocean. Wow. Then you will notice a change in the weather. And when it does, you can thank God together. So they threw poor old Jonah head over knee, out of the boat and into the sea. And what happened next was strange, but not gory. Enter one whale to add bulk to the story. Can you see the whale? Did Jonah see it coming? I couldn't really say, but the whale gulped, gulped him down without much delay. He must have been hungry. Do you think he was hungry? Gulping down so quickly? Or was it a plan? Let's see what happens. Well, I've stayed in motels that were small and quite smelly, but at least I had a bed and a mattress and a telly. Jonah shared the space with the whale's last dish. There was squid, there was octopus, and there, of course, was fish. Can you see them in the picture? The octopus and the fish and the squid. Sometimes pages are hard to open. Is it like that when you're reading a book? Would you arrange your thoughts in a while? There's a strong possibility your logic would fail. But Jonah's intelligence returned quite fair. He closed his eyes and sent up a prayer. Is that what you do when you're in trouble? When you need some help? Please God, help me. I don't want to die. I have yet to say to my family goodbye. Well, the blubber on a whale makes for good insulation. That's the skin of a whale. That's the, it's very, very thick. Would his prayer make it through? Would he receive confirmation that, that his plead had been heard that his life would not end, that help from above like dew would descend. After three days and nights, his answer came quick. The big heavy whale started feeling sick. Why do you think he started feeling sick? Did he eat something he wasn't supposed to? Do you feel sick when you eat things that you're not supposed to? Or if you have too much or something? I know I do. Let's see what happens next. With a burp and a noise that wasn't so grand, the whale spat Jonah out onto the sand. Well, Jonah stood up from the wet sandy beach and headed for, where do you think? For Nineveh and started to teach. Isn't that what God wanted him to do in the first place? I think so. He must have taught well for the people understood. They stopped being bad and started being good. Well there, moose friends, I'll end it right here. That was scary, I know, but you don't have to fear. Sometimes in our life, God will interrupt. He shows us the best way so we don't self-destruct. Remember God made us and knows what is best. Follow his ways and you will be blessed. That's the end of our story. And thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful time on this beautiful Sabbath day and we'll see you all 
next Sabbath. Thank you. Bye. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow for the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of the world, His love breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion. The Lion of Judah, he's roaring in power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sins of this world, his blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee Sounds a new beginning. As distant hearts begin believing, redemption's bid is unrelenting. Your love goes on. Your love goes on. Carry us, carry us when the world gives way. You cover us, cover us in your endless grace. Your love is relentless. Your love is relentless. You gave the world a light to follow A hope that shines beyond tomorrow Your love goes on Your love goes on You carry us 
when the world gives way you cover us cover us with your endless grace your love is relentless your love is relentless your love is relentless your love is relentless tearing through the veil of darkness breaking every chain you set us free fighting for the furthest heart you gave your life for all to see tearing through the veil of darkness breaking every chain you set us free fighting for the furthest heart you gave your life your love is relentless 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 is astronomic your purpose is titanic and your verdict's oceanic yet in your largeness nothing gets lost not a man nor a mouse slip between the cracks your love is meteoric your loyalty is astronomic Your purpose is titanic And your verdict's oceanic Yet in your largeness nothing gets lost Not a man nor a mouse Oh, slip between the cracks, hey How exquisite is your love, oh God Hey Open up our eyes and captivate our hearts with your love. Oh, oh. You mend our broken bridges, know all of us by name. And even though we turn away, you love us just the same. And by your blood we are redeemed By your wounds we are healed We are set free Hey, how exquisite is your love, oh God Hey, open up our eyes and captivate our hearts With your love Hey, how exquisite is your love, oh God Hey, open up our eyes and captivate our hearts with your love Word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shot up deep within my bones. 
And I am weary of holding it in Indeed, I cannot Your word is in my heart like a fire Oh, fire shut up deep within my bones And I am weary of holding it in Oh, indeed, I cannot Let it burst forth Hey, how exquisite is your love, oh God Open up our eyes and captivate our hearts with your love. Whoa. Your love is meteoric, your loyalty is astronomic, your purpose is titanic, and your verdict's oceanic. Yet in your largeness nothing gets lost Not a man nor a mouse slip between the cracks We were doing so well. We had gone weeks and if we didn't include that case over a fortnight ago, almost a full month, over a full month in fact, of having no new COVID-19 cases in South Australia. In fact, South Australia was deemed to have no active cases at all. That was until this week. An overseas traveller who had gone through Victoria of all places came to South Australia and with her, she brought the COVID-19 virus. The reaction and the backlash on social media and talk back radio was immediate. How come she was allowed in when others were not? I thought our borders were closed. Why did this foreign lady get to come here and bring this virus with her? One caller rang up ABC talk back radio. She said the following, she says, it makes my blood boil. I haven't seen my mother, 84 years old since Christmas, yet somebody here is allowed into the state. Some of the feeling was, if we're gonna have the borders closed, then they should be closed. Where do you side on this argument? What do you think? Do you agree with that sentiment? What about when you hear the other side? The exemptions that have been made have been made on compassionate grounds. Hence, people have been allowed to attend funerals so they can come into the state to attend funerals. And in this case, to visit somebody who was terminally ill. How distressing would it be for you if one of your loved ones was dying, but you couldn't go into state or to another country to see them? So which argument is correct? Should we show justice, upholding the requirements? But what about a bit of mercy? This is actually one of the keys in the book of Jonah. It's one of the key themes. And as Tim Keller explains it, this book deals with this question. It deals with the question of how can God be merciful and forgiving to people, yet at the same time, be just. He goes on to explain that that question is not answered in Jonah, but is answered by the one who calls himself the ultimate Jonah. He's referring to Jesus so that he could be both just and justifier of those who believe. And then he concludes by saying, only when we readers fully grasp this gospel will we be neither cruel exploiters like the Ninevites or pharisaical believers like Jonah, but rather spirit-charged, Christ-like men and women. 
Today, we're going to start a new series looking at the book of Jonah. Over the next five weeks, we will dig into this book. And as we explore this book together, it is my prayer that we too will be spirit-changed, Christ-like people. And as we will see today, as we become more Christ-like men and women, it impacts not only on us, but how we respond and relate to others. As we begin this journey, I'm indebted to a book called Opening Up Jonah by Paul Mackerel and also Timothy Keller's book, The Prodigal Prophet, which helped clarify some thoughts about this series. With this introduction, let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you that wherever we are, that we can come together and we can open and spend some time reflecting on your word and reflecting on what you have done. And Lord, as we look at this story and we see its relevance for us today, help us to the apply the lessons that we see in our own lives. Guide us as we do this today, we pray in your name. Amen. When one thinks of Jonah, we don't think of Jonah alone. We always refer to it as Jonah and the... Yeah, if you've got kids at home, they probably help finish that sentence for you. It's Jonah and the... It's Jonah and the whale. This is a story of a man who was swallowed by a big fish. And this causes some people to ask, is this story made up? Is it a fable? Well, there's no doubt that this is an artfully crafted work of literature, that there is beauty in the structure here. In fact, in the first two chapters, we see that Jonah is given a command from God and he fails to obey this command and he becomes miserable. Interestingly, in chapters three and four, God also gives Jonah a command. And this time Jonah obeys the command. And when Jonah obeys the command and carries it out, he becomes miserable. <laughs> the problem here is that God is not doing what Jonah wants him to do. Jonah wants a God who simply smites all the bad people, like the wicked Ninevites, and then blesses all the good people, like Jonah and his countrymen. Instead, when he encounters the real God, yes, he finds a God who is just, but also a God who is full of mercy. So as, if, as to the question, is this a real story? Well, the one who performed the greatest miracle of all, of rising from the dead, Jesus, he talks about Jonah. He tells us that this was a real event. And then we have this. If you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to 2 Kings. Might be a strange place, you think, to start off with a story about Jonah. But let's have a look at 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 14. 2 Kings chapter, uh, chapter 14 and verse 23, it tells us that, G that Jeroboam took the throne and that he is now the king of Israel and he would reign for 41 years. But have a look at, uh, at this 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25 to 27. And this is what it says. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Jeroboam the second recovered the territories of Israel between Labo Hatham and the Dead Sea, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Helper. For the Lord saw the bitter suffering of everyone in Israel and that there was no one in Israel, slave or free, to help them. And because the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel completely, he used Jeroboam II, the son of Je Jehosa, to save them. Did you see it? Did you notice who the prophet was here? It was Jonah, son of Amittai. This passage here fixes Jonah in history. It shows him ministering during the long and successful reign of Jeroboam II, king of Israel. The second striking thing here we see is that he is bringing a positive message from the Lord. And he is bringing this at a time when this nation really needs to hear it. 
In this case, his mission was to go to his own people and to say, despite your sins, it was never God's plan to wipe you out. So these country borders, which have been eaten away by foreign invaders, they will be restored. You don't have to worry about invading armies during this time. And that is indeed what happened. No doubt this was a popular message that Jonah gave to his people. And his popularity rose as he prophesied. And his, his popularity just would have soared off the charts as this prophecy was fulfilled. He was telling the people what God would do, how God wasn't going to allow Israel's enemies to come and wipe them out. His message was how much God loved his own people. It's interesting to note that the name Jonah means dove. And one thing we know about a dove is that it's a home-loving bird. And in this respect, Jonah was well suited to his name. More than anything, Jonah loved his own nation and loved the people of that nation. But as we're about to see, the trouble was it excluded everyone else. And this is where Jonah's troubles begin. So let's turn to the book of Jonah. It's in the Old Testament, one of these Old Testament books, the book of Jonah. And let's pick up the story. Jonah chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. Again, the New Living Translation, it says this. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Same guy, same deal. Verse 2. Get up and go to the great city, city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. Your translation may say the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Like we said, this is the same Jonah that we have seen. The same Jonah who has been a successful prophet among his own people, whose popularity is riding sky high. God comes and he tells him, get up or arise and go. So we would expect Jonah to do just that. But there was a problem. And the problem was what God was asking him to do. And it was where God was asking him to go. He was asking him to go to Nineveh. This wasn't just any city, but it was the great city, Nineveh. Nineveh was great in size. It was great in power and great in military prowess. There was around five times as many people in the city of Nineveh than there were in Jerusalem. Her walls were 100 feet in height and built on a rock foundation. Overshadowing the walls were 1,500 watchtowers and some 200 feet in height. Everything about this mighty city said that she would last for centuries. A more impressive city could not be found. But Nineveh, also housed the great enemies of Israel. Hearing a message that the city could be destroyed by the Lord would have caused great rejoicing in Jerusalem. Yet God wants to warn the Ninevites of the dangerous path that they are treading. And to do that, he sends a Hebrew prophet to a wicked Gentile city. And this is an issue for Jonah. Up to this point, prophets had only been sent to God's people. Uh, Sure, there was a couple. I mean, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos, they wrote a few things about pagan countries, but they are brief. And God never sent them to these countries. What God is asking Jonah to do up to this time is unprecedented. And that God would warn a city like Nineveh, that too up to this time is also unprecedented. In my research for this talk, I found some things that were going on in this city. Let's just say I've decided not to share them with you, but it really was a wicked and violent city. And let's think about Jonah. He's intently patriotic. 
and amazed that God would have sent him to preach to the very people he most feared and hated. While the thought of announcing God's judgment against the city could perhaps be justified, he's probably thinking, what would happen if people heeded and listened to this warning? None of this made sense. Again, it is Keller who says, if any Israelite had come up with this idea, he would have been at least shunned and at worst executed. How could God ask anyone to betray his country interests like this? What's a successful patriotic prophet to do? Let's have a look at verse three. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. In short, Jonah did the opposite of what God called him to do. He was called to go east. So what does he do? He goes west. He was directed to go overland. So he goes via the sea. He was sent to a big city, but in the end, he bought a ticket to the end of the world. And in doing this, look at what he is trying to do. The text says that he is hoping to escape from the Lord. This is madness. Jonah is a prophet of God. He knows the Psalms. He would have known Psalms 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. I wonder if that line was written just for Jonah. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, just like Jonah was trying to do, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Jonah also would have known what David said in the Psalms, in Psalm 16, verse 11, when he says, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Instead of finding joy in the presence of the Lord, when God told him to go to the Gentiles, to the pagans and the foreigners, Jonah tried to run not only from them, but also from God's presence and the ones that God would have us embrace. I wonder if we sometimes have that same tendency. Do we ever try to run from God and his presence? And if so, how did that go? How successful were you really? And what about running from the calling that God has given to you? What calling has God placed on your heart? What calling has he placed on your life? It may be something that doesn't make sense to you and perhaps you've been trying to run away from that. Yet as you do, you continue to feel his call. How do you handle that? What excuses are you making as you continue to try and run away? If you are trying to run away, Jonah says you won't be the first. And maybe there's something in this story that God is trying to tell you. I guess we can also ask the question, why did Jonah run? At the most practical level, the prospects of success were none. The chances of Jonah dying were very high. So that makes sense. But there was also a theological issue here. The prophet Nahum had years before prophesied that God would destroy Nineveh for its evil. This made perfect sense. So wouldn't a successful mission to Nineveh only destroy God's promises to Israel and prove that Nahum was a false prophet? What possible justification then could there be for this assignment? See, Jonah had a problem with the job he was given. He had a bigger problem with the one who gave it to him. Jonah concluded that because he couldn't see any good reason for God's command, that there couldn't be 
any good reason at all. Jonah doubted the goodness, the wisdom, the justice of God. At heart, he thought his ways were better than God's. Isn't this the kind of thinking that got us into this mess in the first place? Wasn't there an angel, a beautiful angel in heaven, who looking around said, you know what, I think my ways will be better than God's. And didn't this same angel who now turned into a snake, wasn't he in the garden who convinced Eve that my way, not God's, your own way is better than God's? Wasn't it he who said, God cannot have your best interests in mind? Look how good this fruit is. Surely it won't hurt if you eat it. And isn't it a trap that we can all easily fall into? God, this just doesn't make sense. So I'm going to do it not the way you directed, but my way. Whenever we replace God with self, we are setting ourselves up for a fall. You see, here is something that Jonah could never imagine. While it made sense, God, and in this case Jonah, loved his own people, those who were already inside the family of God. What was really doing Jonah's head in was that God could love people outside of the family that God could love the pagans, the Gentiles, that he loves those who are in wicked big cities, that people that don't know him yet. And he wants other people to know about God. This message of love and salvation was to go not only to the Israelites, but it was to go to all nations, to all cities, to all peoples. Yet faced with the choice of responding to God's call or going out of his comfort zone, Jonah fled. He would rather run than attempt to save. And if you want to fail at the calling that God has given you, and if we want to fail at the calling that God has given us to go and make disciples, we just do what Jonah did. Don't care about those outside our walls or don't care about those who are different from us, believe different or look different and simply look or run the other way. Jonah tells us there is great danger in that. One of the great connections of scripture is where Jonah goes. He goes to the port of Joppa. The very city where hundreds of years later, the apostle Peter would receive a vision of unclean animals coming down from a sheep with the message, go minister to people outside of your nationality. Go minister to people who are different to you, people outside of your faith. The good news of the gospel isn't just for insiders, it's for all. So don't Jonah goes down to Joppa. He boards a ship. And he sails away. Have a look at verse 4 to verse 6. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm to threaten to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold, so the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted, get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Jonah runs, but God won't let him go. He tries to hide, but God knows where he is. In the original language, this word down is repeated time and time again. In 1 verse 3, he goes down to Joppa. And then the text continues. He goes down into the ship. He goes down into the hold. Eventually, he will sink down, down to the depths of the sea. Not so much as a record of his geographical location. This is a chart of Jonah's moral decline. You can feel Jonah. He is sinking lower and lower. 
What Jonah didn't realize was he was being chased by God. God was after him. The Lord didn't merely send the storm. The text says that he hurled it at the ship. This word hurled is the same word as means of throwing a weapon or a spear. It's used three times in this chapter. The Lord hurled the storm, the storm. The crews hurled the cargo overboard and eventually they would hold Jonah himself into the sea. If Jonah refused to go into the great city, he would go into a great storm. Then again, is not it true that every act of disobedience has a storm attached to it? For Jonah, the storm was a consequence of his sin. But notice, the sailors were caught into it as well. Storms can come as a consequence of living in a fallen and troubled world. But amazing things can happen in a storm. Globally, Aren't we just coming out of a storm right now? Aren't we in the middle of a global pandemic? And while I'm not suggesting that God sent this, I am suggesting that God can use this for his purpose. You see, storms can wake us up to truths that we would otherwise never see. Storms can develop faith, hope, love, patience, humility and self-control in us like nothing else can. And there are lots of people who will testify that they gave their heart to Jesus in the midst of a storm. In our text, the hardened soldier, uh, sailors are terrified by what they are seeing. They understand that this is no ordinary storm. They are aware that this storm has divine origins and they call out to their gods gods that can't hear, gods that can't see, certainly. But they were struggling to find out which particular gods or deities they should be calling out to. But they are calling out and praying. They are praying to any god they can find, any god who can help. And Jonah, well, he should have been the one who was leading the prayer meeting. It seems that running away had become a habit with him. Having run from the Lord, he runs from the confusion and turmoil going on all around him and he finds a hiding place. Unlike the Lord Jesus who fell asleep amidst the storm after a heavy day's work, Jonah's sleep is that of the idle, guilt-ridden escapist. He's trying to get away. He doesn't care that the ship is breaking. He seems he cares as much about the plight of the sailors as he does for the people of Nineveh. Not at all. The pagan captain. In the middle of the storm, he goes down into the boat and wakes the prophet of God. He rebukes Jonah because he has no interest in their common good. The captain is saying, can't you see we're about to die? How can you be so oblivious to our need? The captain says, I understand that you are a man of faith. Why aren't you using your faith for public good? Why aren't you praying to God for us? Why aren't you praying for our salvation? This pagan captain is calling the prophet of Yahweh to prayer. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Isn't God's prophet supposed to call other people to prayer? And that's not all. If we were reading this in Hebrew, we would have picked up that when the captain wakes up Jonah, he says, arise, call. These are the exact same words God uses when calling Jonah to arise and call Nineveh to repentance. But as Jonah wakes up and rubs his eyes, there is this pagan sea captain with God's very words in his mouth. What is this? God sent his prophet to point the pagans towards himself. Yet now it is the pagans pointing the prophet towards God. By now, if you're beginning to feel a little uncomfortable with where this is, is heading, Imagine if you were a Jew reading this. There is an unmistakable role reversal happening in this book. Jonah, he is out of touch with his peril, whereas the soldiers are extremely alert. Jonah absorbed with his own problems, 
while everyone else is trying to seek the common good of everyone on the boat. They pray to their own God, but Jonah doesn't even pray to his. And in this role reversal, the reader sense that Jonah, that Jonah, the Judean prophet, is not the good guy in this story at all. And those on the ship sense this as well. Have a look from verse 7 to 10. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused this terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us, they demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them that he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. They'd cast lots and it falls to Jonah and the crew discover that Jonah is the cause for the biggest storm that they had ever seen. Yet instead of grabbing him and immediately throwing over him overboard, they ask questions. Why? Why did, why did you do this? Who are you? They carefully take his evidence and testimony in order to make the right decision. They show him and his God, even at this time, great respect. At face value, we think Jonah answers well. But notice, first he identifies himself as a Hebrew, not as a servant of God. He says, I am a Hebrew. And then he says, I fear the Lord. Well, I wonder how well his actions have been showing this at present. I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. I think hearing that, imagine how the sailors must have felt. If they were scared before, they are now terrified by his answer. They've been searching for a God who is able to stop the storm. Now Jonah identifies this God as the one who actually made the sea. And they know that Jonah is running away from him. You can almost see their mouths drop open. And the text says that they groan. Oh, why did you do it? Or your translation may say, what is it that you have done? It's a haunting question. And as we close and look at the application of these first 10 verses, we can ask the question is, What does God want us to do with this? Here, for the first time, we see that Jonah finally talks about his faith. But here is the problem. The sailors could plainly see that even though Jonah talked the talk, he definitely wasn't walking the walk. Paul Mackerel, in his book, Opening Jonah, he writes the following. He says, it was here that the chasm between what Jonah professed with his lips and the life that he was living gaped the widest. The sailors have had their world turned upside down, almost literally. With Jonah's explanation in verse 9, a new understanding of the world is beginning to take shape in their minds, although their chances of remaining in it for much longer seem to be fast disappearing. Even so, They cannot fathom how Jonah can have behaved in such a way when he confessed knowing and worshipping the God who controls everything. The words seem to trip off Jonah's tongue so easily. But what about his life? As important as the verbal testimony is, we have to ask about the supporting evidence. The point is that the Christian is not just called to give evidence. He must be evidence. I think from these verses that we have looked at today, this is one of the big lessons that we can take from this text. The Christian must be, must live evidence that Christ is dwelling inside. If you are a Christ follower, then live and act like it. 
saying with your mouth, I worship the Lord, but then trying to run as far and as fast away as possible from him just doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. And I want to suggest that the only true way to do this is to have Christ living inside of you. Remember what we said right at the very beginning. It's only when we fully grasp the gospel that we will be spirit changed, Christ-like men and women. So let the grace of Christ transform your heart. And from that, let that control and guide your actions. So the challenge for me and the challenge for you today is, is your life evidence of Jesus living inside? Does it show through the way you treat others the thing that matters most to Jesus? Most of you would know or have heard this statement from Brenda Manning. The single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. In this story, the sailors couldn't believe it either. Does your lifestyle match your words? Have you let Jesus transform your heart? If you talk the talk, then make sure you walk the walk. The second thing we can find is when we compare the actions of Jonah with the actions of the captain. This pagan captain, he cares for his ship, for his crew, for his passengers. He prays, he urges others to pray to their gods. He is doing everything possible to save people who are entrusted to him. Jonah, he doesn't care for these people. He runs from them. In fact, he wants them dead. From these 10 verses, we also see that believers are to respect and that we can also learn from the wisdom God gives to those who don't believe. Let me explain. Jonah was a follower of the law of the Lord and of the true God. So how is it possible that these pagans were outshining Jonah? Isn't it true that non-believers sometimes act more righteously than believers despite their lack of faith? Whereas believers... Sometimes if they still cling on with remaining sin, they often act far worse than their right belief in God would lead us to expect. Let me go out on a limb here and take this a step further. And let me just talk to my own people for a minute. The Seventh Day Adventists, God has given us a wonderful end time message and we are to take it to the world. It's a message that people desperately need to hear. And we can see that God has raised us up. God has called us to proclaim this message. But because God has specifically called us, every now and then you'll hear that some say that we should only read Adventist books or only listen to Adventist speeches and only watch Adventist TV and sing Adventist hymns. These are all great things, but the implication is that we cannot learn anything from other Christians, let alone non-believers. It's clear to me that from the first 10 verses in Jonah that they would disagree. It would also say that there are things that we can learn from those who don't know God. All this is to say that as Christians, especially Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we should be humble and respectful for those who do not have the same faith as we do. We should be appreciative to the world of all people, knowing that at times God has given even non-believers things that they can teach us. Our message is too important to get this part wrong. Jonah learns this the hard way. The final point is this. On this ship, and indeed later in this story, 
Jonah finds himself in a close encounter with people who are radically and religiously different from him. As we have highlighted, his behaviour is dismissive and unhelpful, while the pagans informally act more admirably than he does. And this is one of the main messages of this book. Mainly, God cares how we believers relate to and treat people who are different from us. God wants us to treat people of different races, of different faiths, of different beliefs in a way that is respectful, that is loving, that is generous, that is just, that is merciful. He calls us to interact with them in this way. And here is the great irony. Jonah had rejected God's call to preach to Nineveh because he didn't want to talk to pagans about God or lead them towards faith. And so he fled, only to find himself talking about God to the exact sort of people he was fleeing. This is how much people matter to God. And if people matter to God, then they need to matter to us. In this story, in the middle of the storm, we see God's mercy at work. Not only was God revealing himself to these sailors, he was drawing Jonah back to change his heart. And changing hearts is, 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 the, is the business that God is in. He delights to change hearts, both our own and the hearts of those around us. And for that, we all can be thankful. Thanks for being with us today. Next week, this series will continue. And next week, we'll meet one of the most famous characters in the whole of the book of Jonah, the whale. Travis Townend will be leading us through that, and I know that you'll appreciate what he has to say. I'd also encourage you, as restrictions begin to, li to lift, why don't you invite a couple of people around to your home and maybe you could open up this text and maybe you could spend some time in it and share some reflections that you yourselves have found. Maybe go through the Bible discovery reading of yourself and interact with each other and see what implications does this story tell for us today. Let's just pray as we close. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for the story and for the passage that we have looked at. And Lord, as we have looked at the story of Jonah, we see that you love to delight to change hearts. And Lord, we see that you are trying to change Jonah's heart, just as you're trying to change the hearts of others around you, because you want more and more people to know and to fully follow you. Lord, help us to be that people. Help us not to be so proud, but help us to be humble and help us to interact with others in a way that is respectful and loving and help us to know and understand that because people really matter to God, that they matter to us too. We want to be a loving people ready for your soon return and get others ready for that return too. Keep us safe until that day. We pray in your loving and saving name.